There's a roll. It's a lot easier at 3G's. Run the space, everyone. Yeah. Good to be back. I don't remember liftoff being quite that violent. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Why did you want to be an astronaut? Well, I always loved flying. I loved flying in airplanes, and uh, uh, so that was kind of natural to me, and I was always interested in the, in the space program. And so it was one of those things where at first I wanted to get involved in the space program, and I became a, uh, a flight controller down here at the Johnson Space Center. And uh, I became very interested in the space program. I enjoyed working, working on it. And then as I transitioned the Air Force to a flying career as a, as a backseater, as a flight test engineer, I started getting some of the flight experience that I liked, and now I had some space experience and some flying experience, and now I could possibly take seriously the chance of becoming an astronaut. And so I said, well, I'd really better, you know, pursue this like I've always wanted to because I have a chance now, and I wouldn't uh, feel comfortable with just kind of letting it slip by. And so as I got more experience in the Air Force and the flight test field, and I decided to apply. I applied once to the, uh, to the program and didn't get accepted. I figured, well, if this goal is worth having, it's worth trying hard for. And so I applied again a couple years later, and that time I got in. Before that, what made you interested in flying and in the space program? Well, my father was a, uh, a B-17 pilot during the World War II era, so he was a pilot, and, and he loved uh, flying, and so he used to take us to air shows. And I think there's something about uh, a flying that sometimes runs in the blood, and so that's something that's passed on from uh, my dad to me. And, uh, I, and like I say, I really loved flying, and so I was always interested in aviation. Let's Tell me about the background. Let's start with your hometown. Tell sure. me about your hometown and what it was like growing up there. Sure. I grew up in uh, San Carlos, California. It's a town of about 30,000 people south of San Francisco. It's a great place to grow up. Uh, pretty normal middle America, you know, uh, playing sports, little league, you know, uh, football. And uh, uh, I had a, a great support structure, a wonderful mother and father that uh, really, uh, really took good care of me and made sure I, I was, I was, uh, going down the right path for school and everything and uh, really stressing that. And I had great teachers uh, from, from grade school, middle school, high school, and then on into college. And the, like I say, the, the people there were, were, were very, very supportive and a very good community and it was a great place to grow up. You get to see it during your flights? Yeah, d during my first flight that was one of my main goals was I wanted to see my hometown San Carlos from space and so I had to do a little research because you know you're going 17,500 miles an hour so it's not a piece of cake to spot your hometown from 200 miles up. So I looked at some pictures from space of the San Carlos area and you know the peninsula of uh, near San Francisco Peninsula looks kind of like a thumb and so I knew if I, I could find that really easy. So the first thing you see is the coast of California, see the thumb where San Francisco is and as you get closer you look for, uh, yeah, you need a binoculars to do this or a, high, a telephoto lens. But I looked for uh, Highway 280, which is right, goes right up and down the peninsula, and there's a reservoir, a big reservoir on the, on the west side of that. I knew that if I found the reservoir, went to the southern tip, looked across the highway, that's San Carlos. And so I got my uh, binoculars out, and we were coming up on the coast of California one time, on SDS-110, my first flight, and sure enough, I could, I could, I could see the reservoir, and uh, I, could see, uh, I could see the 280 area, and I could basically navigate my way to San Carlos, and I could see places where I could recognize the San Carlos airport, and I could even follow the streets up to the area where I grew up and it was just a fantastic thing to be able to, to, to see your hometown from space to think when I was a little kid I used to look up and watch the airplanes fly over in my backyard and here I was flying over at Mach 25 and uh, looking down at my hometown way higher than those airplanes yeah. were. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about the the path then from San Carlos through your education and your Air Force career that led you here yeah well I, uh, I went to school at the University of California Berkeley and uh, I wanted to be a pilot originally and uh, so I, I went through ROTC at Berkeley, and I also got an engineering degree because I always knew that the flying thing doesn't always work out. You know, your eyes could go bad or, or, or anything. And so I got a mechanical engineering degree from Berkeley and then graduated from ROTC and went down to pilot training. And they said I had a heart murmur and they wouldn't let me fly. And so from that point on, uh, I thought, well, hey, I'll never get to fly and I'll, uh, I'll have to do something else. So I took an engineering, the engineering route in the Air Force. but. I heard that while I, while I couldn't be a pilot, I could be a backseater and be a flight test engineer. So I took some various uh, engineering jobs at, in the Air Force and I, I tried to get my resume good so that I could apply to this uh, flight test engineer course at, at test pilot school.
And, and about seven years later, I, I applied to, uh, uh, to the flight test engineer course and I got accepted. And uh, I went to get my waiver for the, so I could get to, for this uh, heart murmur they said I had so I could find the back seat. And when I went to get the waiver, the doctor said, well, you don't have a heart murmur. And uh, so in the seven years since the pilot training where they wouldn't let me fly, they had gotten better equipment and they had changed their criteria for what constitutes this heart murmur. So that opened up, obviously, the flight test engineer course. But then since I no longer had a heart murmur, well, there was a chance I could become an astronaut. So I... Uh, went through my career as a flight test engineer and uh, went through the course and worked on the F-16 project out at Edwards for, for four years and, and then had a chance to apply to, to NASA. And like I say, on the second time I, I applied, I got in. When you were thinking that you couldn't be a pilot, were you still had the goal of astronaut? Well, no. When it, it looked like my dreams were over there. When I first got out of college, when I was at uh, Williams Air Force Base, they told me I had a heart murmur. I was never going to fly. You know, maybe as a backseater, but I was certainly wouldn't. I, I, I figured, okay, I'm never going to become a pilot, and how on earth would I ever become an astronaut? So that was completely out of the question. So if somebody had tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, don't worry, kid, you're going to end up flying in space someday, I would have said, you got to be kidding me. So it, uh, it all worked out, uh, but it was quite a different path than I thought it was going to take. And then you've gotten here to a, a job that where the, the flying in space part of this job is one that's certainly got its challenges. Well, Rex, what is it that you think we get or, or learn as a result of flying people in space that makes you feel that that's worth doing? Well, there's a number of uh, reasons. Number one, you can, you're, we're leaving the planet for the first time. You know, we've, we've been in space for 50 years, but we're still eking our way off Earth and having a, a permanent... Um, a permanent presence in space, and that's what the space station is doing. And it's important to, to keep pushing our boundaries, just like the uh, pioneers in the old days pushed the boundaries and went farther west. And we're learning about our Earth, we're learning about how the human body adapts to space, and, uh, and we're learning all sorts of ways um, physical activities and biological processes behave in space that are different. It's an it's a incredible new area to research and to understand, and it's very exciting. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it really is still amazing to, to both watch the space program and also to be a part of it and so it's uh, despite its challenges it's uh, it's definitely rewarding and, and I consider myself very fortunate to be a part of it in whatever aspect and and once my flying career is done I still want to be a part of it because uh, I just uh, love being part of the space program. You're one of the four crew members on the final flight of Space Shuttle Atlantis, Rex. Could you give me a summary of the work that's planned for STS-135 and what your jobs are going to be? Yeah, STS-135 is mainly a resupply mission to the space station. So we're bringing up just tons of supplies, food, clothing, experiments. And then we're bringing back stuff that uh, really only the space shuttle has the capability of doing, large, heavy objects, and uh, just a, a, a volume of of equipment that no other vehicle can bring back. So my job's first uh, on the way up there is I'm sitting uh, in between the, the pilot and commander and we're gonna help uh, monitor the systems and deal with any failures we have during the launch sequence. And then uh, we're gonna rendezvous with the space station and uh, I'll be helping them out uh, with the computers and uh, making sure everything's operating properly as we're coming into the uh, into the uh, space station. Once we get to the space station, the main job is going to be haul all that stuff from the uh, multi-purpose logistics module, which we're carrying up, which holds all the uh, equipment, over to the space station. And then once we get most of that stuff out, bringing down the stuff that uh, that we need to bring down. In the, in the middle of all that, we're also going to have a spacewalk where I'm going to be what's called IV or intervehicular uh, help for the uh, spacewalker. So I'm going to be reading their checklist. When you're out doing a spacewalk, you can't carry your checklist with you. So all the checklists there, and I'll guide them through the activities, uh, let them know what they got to do next, and kind of choreograph the the, uh, the spacewalk with the help from uh, the Mission Control Center. And then uh, when we've uh, rebirthed the, the MPLM back into the payload bay, I'll help uh, again on the, on the flight deck with the uh, landing sequence. There are only four of you going up on this mission. Yes. Why just four? Since we are the last space shuttle mission, we don't have the, uh, the luxury of having another shuttle that can come up and get us if we have a problem with the space shuttle. So our rescue scenario, if we do have a problem with the space shuttle, we can't bring it back home, is to come back via Soyuz spacecraft. And uh, now we don't have Soyuz up there all that often. They rotate every six months. And so uh, in order to come back down, we'd have to cycle down on Soyuzes, and that would take a long time. So the, the optimal crew size is about four. Otherwise, people end up staying on the space station for a very extended period of time before they can get a, hitch a ride home. Even as it is uh, under this scenario, uh, some of you, were this be to, to come about, would be staying on the station yes. for, for, uh, for a, an extra right. uh, period of time. Right. Uh, describe that 
scenario? What's the plan then, if well, we had to, to bring you guys? Yeah, on? the the plan would basically to uh, to kind of change the the down sequence of when people would come down. Some of the folks on the space station would stay longer than they anticipated, and then uh, as sp spots free up for the people who are, were going to go down at a certain time, we'll cycle our crew down one by one, and then they'll also launch uh, Soyuz spacecraft up with just two people instead of three, which leaves a spot for them to come down with one of our crew members. And so uh, we will kind of methodically do that until everybody's rotated down. But how do you feel about that? Are you comfortable with the idea of coming home on a Soyuz and oh, yeah. maybe getting a couple extra months in space? Right. Well, coming home on the Soyuz doesn't bother me. That's, uh, we know that's a very well-proven system that, can, uh, that has been operating for years and years and does a great job of bringing people to and from space. So that's not a problem. Staying in space for a long time, it'd be a, it would really be a privilege. And it would be tough because we haven't been trained on how to, everything works on the space station. But we can kind of stick together as a four-person team with the shuttle crew because Sandy uh, Magnus, one of our crew members, has has been there before. She spent six months there, so she can somewhat train us and, and, and bring us up to speed without interfering with the regular day-to-day -day ops in the space station. And we can learn the types of things we can do. And then we all have our own um, capabilities that we've, we, we come up with, like uh, Doug knows robotics and stuff. Sandy knows the, the life in the space station. I uh, have a lot of time with, uh, in the EVA area. So we can all kind of help concentrate on those areas and then expand what we know so we can help out on the space station from a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you've been to the space station before. In fact, all four of you have been there at yes. least once before. And yep. as you say, Sandy has been there for an extended period of time. Has that experience helped you guys as you've been training for this flight? Yeah, it does help. The things we're doing are not all that out of the ordinary. Uh, it's, a, it's a great mission. It's going to be it's going to be exciting. But the individual tasks most people have done before over the period of the space shuttle program. So that's not the real challenge. The real challenge is doing it with just four people. So uh, we'll have uh, we'll have a lot to do, and we'll each get a chance to do something we haven't done before. So we'll take our base areas of expertise. We'll work on those that we've done before. Um, like for me being a mission specialist too, I've done that before, which is helpful. There's still always a lot to learn, but I can do that. And and uh, working with the EVA crew, that'll be. Uh, feel real like, like home for me, which is great. And then I'll expand to do stuff like work on the computers and, uh, and other stuff I haven't done before, which will be more of a challenge. But uh, uh, other people have done it before, so I'll learn from them and, uh, and we'll get everything done. It's been a while since you've been a to the station. Yes. What are you looking forward to of seeing when you get back there? Well, I think probably what everybody wants to see is the cupola, the the big windowed module where you can stick your head out there and see, you know, 360 degrees around you. It's about the closest you can come to doing a spacewalk without uh, putting the spacesuit on. So, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I also haven't seen the Japanese module before, so I'll be uh, interested in, uh, in in going in there and, and seeing uh, how that looks, and it'll be a, it'll be a really neat experience to see the space station basically in its final configuration. So it'll be quite a treat to see all that. Yeah, there's a lot more of it than there was the last yes, there time. there is. Yeah, and it, it's amazing to me how big it gets each time I, I go there. When I was there in, uh, in 2002 on STS-110, um, it was it was it seemed big at the time, but it compared to 122, and we've added uh, uh, Node 2 and uh, the Columbus module, the European Laboratory module. It uh, it it was much bigger, and now it's going to seem just uh, enormous. So it's every time you you start the rendezvous to the space station, it just it just blows your mind just how big this thing is and what an incredible uh, vehicle we put together up in space. As you said, the the biggest priority for this flight is delivering a well, frankly, a shuttle full of yep. supplies yep. to the International Space Station. Tell me about the kind of cargo that you and your crewmates are bringing to orbit. Well, the main thing we're going to bring is, uh, like we said, supplies. So that is everything from um, from lots of food to clothing, and then we're also going to help them resupply their science. Uh, you know, they've got a lot of uh, scientific equipment they need up there. And then just the, even the space station components, such as, you know, global positioning system antennas, rate gyro assemblies, just the various uh, things we need to, to keep the space station running and keep it livable, too. There is a spacewalk on this flight, on uh, flight day five. Yes. But unlike previous shuttle flights, there are station crew members who are going to be the ones going outside to you do bet. the work. Uh, what's the reason for that assignment? Well, you know, we're one big team with the, the space shuttle and the space station crew members, and we have to figure out what's the best way to use your resources. And since t we are a little bit short-handed on this flight with just four people, uh, we figured it was best to let the station crew members do the spacewalk, and we're going to be helping them out, so uh, we're all going to be busy that day. Um, well, you know, Sandy and Doug will be doing robotics. I'll be doing the uh, the, the checklist from the inside, and and uh, Chris will be uh, suiting them up in the airlock. So we're busy, but it uh, it works out uh, real well this way. Um, Ron Guerin and uh, and Mike Fossum have already done spacewalks together too, so they're a great team to send out there and and do our EVA tasks. 
All right, well, tell us about what they're going to do this time. What, what's on that checklist that you're going to be sure. helping them with? Well, the main thing, uh, the first thing we're going to do is bring back the, uh, the, the pump module that failed on the space station. You know, last summer, we had a uh, pump module that failed, and it was a big deal. You had to get that thing replaced and quickly to uh, restore the cooling to the electronics inside the space station. And uh, so that uh, pump module was swapped out. We put a new one in there, but the old one that failed uh, has been sitting up in the space station ever since. And we'd like to bring that home to, number one, find out what happened, because you learn a lot from, uh, from failures of equipment in space. Say, hey, what's our failure mode? Maybe we didn't expect this, or is it something we expected? And then uh, potentially we could refurbish it and launch it again later on for another spare if we needed to. The, the second thing, so that we're going to take from the, uh, space, uh, from the space station and put it in the payload bay of the shuttle. Once we get in the payload bay of the shuttle, uh, Ron and Mike are going to take a, what's called the robotics refueling module and uh, take this payload and put it onto the space station. And, uh, and the robotics refueling module, or RRM, is a uh, kind of a test bed of sorts that is going to be used to see how we can uh, remotely uh, service uh, satellites in space. What it's got is it's got a bunch of uh, places where a, the this uh, space station's uh, special purpose de dexterous manipulator or SPDM can grab onto it, take off caps, try different things that normally we'd have a human spacewalker do, and see if it can be done remotely. For instance, pulling up flaps, cutting MLI or either insulation, and, and um, taking uh, taking caps off, or even potentially uh, moving fuel from uh, one vehicle to another. So there's ways to test that with the RRM that we're really excited about. It should tell us a lot about how hard it is to uh, remotely service a, a, a satellite in space. Find out just how dexterous exactly. it is. Exactly. And so it really is the chance to show how well the SPDM can function in space. So it'll be a, it'll be a challenge from, the, uh, from the, the, the payload standpoint, but also from the robotic standpoint for how we, how we go about doing these tasks. And I'm sure we're going to learn a ton because there's a lot of neat uh, tools that this, uh, this spacecraft has that we can, we can test out uh, on, uh, on the space station to figure out, hey, are there better ways of doing this? Are there better ways of making satellites so that we can uh, refuel them or, or service them easier in space? And are there better ways robotically to handle situations like this? Now, to be clear, the this uh you're, you're delivering this, but all this, the work that we've talking about, this test, is not going to occur during no. your mission. No, the, the RRM we will put on the space station where the, uh, the SPDM, or the robotic arm, can get to it and take care of all these tasks later on when we have more time. We have a very, very compressed timeline. We're, we're trying to do so much in this time with, uh, like I said, with the shorthanded crew that uh, a lot of the stuff we're going to get set up so people can take care of it later and, and work when they have more time. And you've got arm operations that are going to assist in both of these yes. tasks, right? Yes. What else is on the timeline besides those two things? And that's the, well. Those are the main tasks for the spacewalk. Now, the uh, ex after we that we have we'll have some extra time to do what we call get ahead tasks, and those are still a little bit in flux. With those kind of change depending on what the highest priority is at the time. So we have a number of tasks that we've trained for, that, and Ron and Mike have trained for. And uh, when we dis when we get closer to flight, we'll decide. Okay, these are the these are the highest priorities. These are the ones we're going to want you to do. No, why waste time playing <laughs> practicing for it now when we can use you for what's needed then? That's right. That's right. Now most of the time that you're going to be up there outside of this spacewalk, all of the crew members are going to be involved in moving over yes. the, the materials being delivered and bringing stuff back. It's sort of like packing up one house and right. packing up two houses and moving them across the out at the same door. Uh, give us a sense of, of what's involved here, not just in terms of moving items, but knowing where they are and where they're supposed to go and, and knowing what goes when. Right. It's, it's quite a puzzle game. And the, the very first most important rule is do what Sandy says. Because <laughs> Sandy's lived up there and she's our load master, so she knows where, uh, where things go and also how is the best way to rearrange stuff. And so uh, you know, I'll be her assistant. And so uh, we'll, we'll figure out ways to, to make that shell game happen. because. Before you bring stuff back, obviously you got to make a hole for it. And is it and can you bring all this stuff out of the um, out of the multi-purpose logistics module uh, before you start bringing stuff back in, or do you bring them back part at a time? So it's kind of one of those puzzle games where we will start bringing stuff in before we have offloaded everything. So it can get confusing. So we have some uh, really talented transfer people on the ground to help us keep it straight, and then we have uh, transfer books to make sure uh, we know what goes where, and then we just uh, do the uh, do the shell game and and try to take care of it all and invariably there'll be a piece or two that go okay did somebody move this and if we didn't sign for it and say where we moved it to it can be a problem so we have to be very dedicated about uh, about annotating where things went who put them where and, and all that kind of thing 
say, I'm wondering whether or not it's, <clears throat> excuse me, all plotted out down to the finest detail, or do you are you going to have to ad lib? We're going to have to ad lib somewhat because we'll go grab stuff that's uh, uh, that's on the space station that we need to put in in our return uh, canister, basically, and we'll put it in what we call a bungee jail. It's a, a bunch of bungees that go across, and we can push them in there and the end there, and they won't they'll kind of float around in there, but they won't go anywhere. So, so we'll be cramming a bunch of stuff in the bungee jail and taking a bunch of stuff out and taking it over to the station. Um, we'll we'll make sure we annotate when stuff goes across, but some of the stuff in the bungee jail, you don't know exactly where it is, and you just got to kind of fish it out of there and then put it in its final stow location. So some of it will be an audible. We'll, we'll look and we'll know, hey, this is this is not working. We've got to get to this before we get to that, or this doesn't fit exactly like we thought it was going to. And so there will be a lot of audible and going on. Yeah, delivering is is easy, except that you've got a clear space for the stuff to, right. to go into. Right. It's a uh, that that's well. That's why you've got several days to do it all. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> yep. When the joint timeline work at the station is all over, the four of you, the shuttle crew members, are going to mark a milestone with the last undocking of a space shuttle from the International Space Station. Is there anything special on the plan for the undocking operation itself as Atlantis wraps up the shuttle's mission at the station? Well, I think we'll, we'll kind of uh, in some way commemorate that activity and, uh, and just uh, note that this is the last time we're leaving on the space shuttle. And it's again, that's one of those busy days, so we got a lot of work to do, and uh, we'll make sure we're being very careful about everything we have to do. Um, but I think after we start backing away and get a little farther away where we can let down our guard just a little bit, um, we'll, we'll look back at the space station and just uh, uh, think back on what an amazing thing it is that the space shuttle has done, because without the space shuttle, the, the space station would not look anything like it does, because the space, sta the space shuttle is the, the heavy lifter that got those big pieces up there. And so I think that's when we'll kind of look back and say, wow, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing what's been built up here by a, by a group of 17 different nations all working together. And it's, uh, it's neat that uh, we can be a part of it from the, uh, from the U.S. standpoint to, to fly and work on the shuttle to, to make our part happen. The fly around is going to be a little bit different than all the previous ones too, right? Yes, uh, we're, we're looking at flying around uh, basically kind of around sideways instead of, uh, instead of head on. We'll move the station uh, 90 degrees is the, what we're planning on doing and uh, then flying all the way around it so we get a different view of the station as we go around. And that's a, a good way of seeing just what everything on the outside of the space uh, station looks like because it's always important to document, to, to shoot a bunch of pictures and to see what the outside of the space station looks like. Are any, are any insulation flaps coming up? Is anything unexpected not looking like it's uh, supposed to look? And so it's kind of hard to do that when you, when you fly the same way around the space station each time. So this time, if with the space station rotated 90 degrees and we fly around it, we have, we have a good view of, of all sides of the space station. What do you think you're going to be keeping your eyes peeled for as you do that last fly around and final separation? I think, I think big picture, just looking at the space station, say, you know, just kind of, it's taking a step back if I've got a, a few seconds there because sometimes when you're so close to these programs you're so concentrated on your procedures that you just you don't see the enormity of what you're doing. I, I heard from some of the uh, Apollo guys on a one of the specials that was, that was run about that how they, they they wish they had they they stepped back a little more and appreciated the big picture of hey we're sending people to the moon, and so um, hopefully you have a chance for a few seconds to look back on the space station and say look at what, look at what we're building together, we're building the space station and just really appreciate it, just for a few seconds, and then get back to work. When you were assigned to this flight, it was going to be a rescue mission for the last space shuttle mission, and it was going to have flown more than a year ago. Uh, of course, those plans have changed. Uh, what was your reaction, Rex, when you realized, I'm going to be on the last space shuttle mission? Well, it's, it's, it was pretty exciting because whether I flew on this flight or not, I wanted to somehow be a part of the last mission, whether I was helping the mission control, helping down at the Cape, or helping at one of the abort sites. I just love the space shuttle program, and I, I just wanted a chance to be a part of the last mission. And to find out I was assigned to it was really uh, tremendously exciting because I just, like I say, I enjoyed this program so much I want to be there to, to the last wheel stop. And to, to think that I'll be riding on the vehicle till the last wheel stop is really an, an incredible opportunity and that I'm very thankful for. Is it a, a special honor or a responsibility? Yeah, it is a special responsibility because you want to finish strong. You know, the space shuttle program has been amazing what it's done, all the great accomplishments and you just don't want to let that uh, momentum down and uh, so there is a lot of uh, a lot of pressure to do your job right and, to, and like I say to finish strong. And with the end of the program also means a lot of changes are coming at NASA and that includes some layoffs and shutting down some historic facilities. Yes. Uh, what is your feeling about the decision that was made 
to stop flying these vehicles. Yeah, well I understand that we need to move on beyond low Earth orbit and from that point I do understand that we need to develop a vehicle that can get out of low Earth orbit and go on to destinations we want to go on to, you know, past, uh, past Earth, about past uh, to the Moon, asteroids, or hopefully one day to Mars. But it's been painful, there's no question about it. It's been very hard uh, watching people we've worked with for years lose their jobs. It's already started and it's going to continue. And uh, we were just down at the uh, Kennedy Space Center about a, a week ago and there were, there were hundreds of people that were losing their jobs the days we were there. And as hard as that was to see, and many people came up and said, hey, this is my last day, it was really inspiring to see how upbeat they were about their time on the space program. They really treasured being part of the space program, and they, it was just, it really was inspiring how they, they, uh, they understood, hey, they, they saw this coming, and they still wanted to be a part of it for as long as they could, and, uh, and they really treasured the time they worked with the space shuttle program. And uh, I just, uh, I take comfort in that, and I know that there have been some great people, and I've enjoyed working with them as much as uh, they've enjoyed working with the, the space shuttle program. Each mission uh, comes with its own patch, but it co that comes from somewhere. Yes. Tell us about some of the elements that are, are in your patch. There's elements of the NASA emblem, and, right. and of course, the last letter of the Greek alphabet is there, right. too. Right. Well, one of the main things we wanted to show with our patch was that uh, we, the, it was an incredible team that makes the space shuttle program uh, possible. And so that's why we incorporated part of the, uh, the NASA emblem. We wanted to show it's the contractors and the NASA civil servants and the whole team that makes it possible. So that's what that symbolizes. And then, of course, the, the shuttle, a kind of reminiscence almost of the uh, SDS-1 patch a little bit. And then, of course, uh, we did want to commemorate the fact this is the last mission. And to do that, we, uh, we picked the, uh, the um, Greek Omega letter, so, which is the uh, last letter of their alphabet, to kind of commemorate the fact that this is the last mission. I understand that you guys got some special help in designing the patch, too. Yes. Uh, my, my wife is a uh, graphics designer by trade, and so uh, she was helping us with the patch, and uh, she designed this patch. She actually designed our 110 and 122 patches in my previous mission, so I was happy to have her help. It's a lot of work uh, designing the patch, and, uh, and she always does a wonderful job. So it was a pleasure to have her on our team to, uh, to design our patch, and. Uh, and also to, to incorporate all the ideas that we were giving her and other people were giving her also to arrive at a patch that suitably commemorated the last flight of the space shuttle program and uh, we all think it turned out nice. It is nice. It's, it's going to be a part of space shuttle history. Um, let's talk about history. What, what do you consider to be some of the most significant moments in space shuttle history? Well, number one would have to be STS-1. I mean, you just can't get a, around the fact that was an incredible accomplishment to, to put two people on a space shuttle that's never flown unmanned, never been tested completely unmanned, uh, and to get them on there and get them home safely was uh, absolutely amazing. And it still boggles my mind that those guys uh, could hear all the stories of how this is all supposed to work. Okay, these uh, white rockets are going to burn for two minutes, then they're going to come off, and then uh, the, the engines are going to burn for another six and a half minutes, and then the tank's going to come off, and wham, you're in space. And so I go, uh, okay, suit us up, let's go, you know. So it's, uh, it's amazing what, what the first uh, few crews went through to, to, before this thing had been wrung out really well and before we learned the tremendous lessons that we've learned over the years. Uh, they got on board and, and flew. So that was the first part that just sticks out in my mind is STS-1 and, and the initial flights. And then uh, the ability to, to launch inter interplanetary probes, uh, you know, to the, to the planets, uh, launch the Hubble Space Telescope, the incredible accomplishments that... Uh, uh, have been come about from the Hubble Space Telescope. Learning more about our universe are, are just amazing, and that was possible because of the shuttle getting it up there, and then of course the uh, servicing missions, uh, bring, uh, making sure it was uh, fixed and uh, and upgraded over the years. So that was amazing. And then I think the crown jewel of the space shuttle program is just the the heavy lift capability of getting this the space station components up there and literally building the, our portion of the of the space station. Uh, it's an amazing accomplishment. The, what it takes year after year to keep those missions going and to get all the pieces up there, many of which have never fit together before, and to fit them together in space for the first time and it, for it to all work. And to see a completed space station up there is really a testament to not only ingenuity of all the engineers and scientists and people on the ground who worked on the space station, but also the people who worked on the space shuttle that can make such an incredible reusable space vehicle to make that happen. You're going to use Atlantis to, uh, to wrap up this program. What do you think Atlantis's place is going to be in the history? Well, I think it's uh, it's got a, a great storied past in the part of the uh, the space shuttle program. You know, f first uh, launching some, like I say, inter interplanetary probes, Magellan and Galileo, and then uh, working doing Hubble Hubble re Hubble repair missions and and uh, working on that, and then launching some of the heavy 
parts of the space station too. Uh, two of the missions I was on, S0, the, the first portion of the truss, was a very heavy component of the space station was launched by Atlantis because Atlantis has the capability of launching those heavy pieces. And, uh, and on and on about the rest of the portions of the, uh, of the space station that Atlantis launched. So it's been an incredible vehicle and it's done, uh, it's done a lot of the heavy lifting for the, for the space station program. If you expand the view beyond just that vehicle, how is the work of the shuttle program going to be remembered? I think the, the shuttle program will be remembered for, number one, obviously the first reusable spacecraft. Uh, the fact that these vehicles have been flown um, year after year, mission after mission, and you come back and look at them, it's like, it's amazing. This thing, it looks great. And you, we were just in, this, in Atlantis, uh, you know, looking at some uh, pre-flight items uh, last week, and you just look around and you go, this is amazing. This vehicle is 30 years old, and it, it looks beautiful. Um, and, uh, they, they, and that's a testament to the care that the people at the Kennedy Space Center prepare it, service it, make sure it's ready to fly and the care that the people here at the Johnson Space Center around the country that operate the space shuttle make sure that it operates well and we, we keep with this, within its uh, operating limits and, uh, and take care of it and change out things when need to be changed out and upgrade it when it needs to be upgraded that, uh, that it can continue to operate. To have a vehicle that is subjected to the environment that it is in launch and landing for, you know, for up, to toward, up to 30 years is, is absolutely amazing. Any thoughts about what kind of space station we'd have right now, were it not for the shuttle? It'd be a lot smaller. You know, the space, the space shuttle is, is uh, the heavy lifter, like we say, so it brings up the big components of the space station. And then not only that, the space station would look different, it wouldn't be as big, but also we wouldn't have the science we have without the space shuttle program. Because the space shuttle allows us to bring those the big payloads, the big uh, um, uh, large equipment and um, science results back down to earth, which is really the only way we can, we can get those kind of heavy payloads and scientific equipment back down uh, to get the results that we, uh, that we so, uh, so need. Well, after STS-135, it's going to be up to spaceships from other nations and perhaps from private industry to yes. get cargo and crews yep. uh, up to this station for the foreseeable future. Right. As an American astronaut, how do you feel about the future of the International Space Station? Well, I think uh, the, the shuttle has gotten it where it needs to get um, to be able to move on to the next uh, level of the program. You know, we've gotten the big comp components up there, so assembly is complete. And now what we need to do is we need to establish uh, the kind of logistics resupply to handle the utilization process where we're really just doing science on board the space station. So I think we can get there with the uh, commercial entities and the help of our, uh, of our foreign uh, um, uh, uh, partners. We can get the, uh, the items up there that we need up there. Getting them back is going to be a little more of a challenge, but I think we'll get there eventually too. You said that STS-1 was one of the most significant moments in the history of the program. Do you remember where you were when STS-1 took off and how yeah. you felt about that flight? Yeah, I was, uh, I was in college. I was a freshman in college and uh, I remember in the run-up to, uh, to the mission thinking uh, I, that it was amazing because I'd watched the approach and landing tests on TV and when they you know, did the landings for the shuttle and think that was, that was pretty impressive. But to see that whole thing stacked on the pad uh, was, uh, was, was incredible and to, to hear that it all worked out well and, and the launch sequence went well and they came, all came home safe, uh, they both came home safe was uh, was was really amazing. So it uh, it really really got my attention. I remember having a chance to uh, brief some school kids on what the space shuttle was capable of and what it was going to be used for and stuff. And I did that just before the first launch. That so was uh, it was pretty neat to to kind of watch it as it came along and then to to see that it was successful on their first flight. What's your favorite memory out of the space shuttle era? Wow, that's a that's probably a. It's a tough one because it could be many, many things, and of course the the launches and, and landings that I've been on are, are are high up there. But I think part of it is just uh, the ability that has given us to to contribute to this International Space Station program. Because uh, you get on board and on the space station when you fly up there and you you bring a new piece up there and you see these crews working together and they're multi multinational crews and everybody works together. And we all work together, we, we work together, we eat together, we, we laugh about things together, and we're one big team up there. And it's, it's really an amazing example. So the, the international cooperation that, uh, that we contribute to the, the space station via the space shuttle uh, was, was really pretty impressive. Uh, of course, there's nothing like the, the rides to orbit, so I think those will those will stick out uh, stick out highly in my mind. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, the destinations that we're launching to today 
although still in low Earth orbit, are a lot different than where STS-1 was headed 30 years ago when it kicked off this era. Where do you think we're going to go in the next era of human space exploration? Well, I hope we're going to beyond Earth orbit. Uh, it's, it's difficult to get to orbit around the Earth, but it's even harder to get outside of Earth's orbit, to go to places like the Moon, to asteroids, or to Mars, and I hope that's our next step. And I think we'll, we'll, I think we'll get there. It's just going to take some time and some dedication on everybody's part. And it's going to take the same ingenuity we see around here that made the space shuttle possible for 30 years. The people who worked in the control center, who processed the vehicle, who designed and conceived the space shuttle. That same kind of ingenuity is still around here. And uh, we'll need to use that to uh, develop the, the next generation. And the same kind of can-do spirit you saw in the early, the early Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo days. Uh, you know, the kids coming out of college today, they, they've got the same smarts and they've got the same drive. And we need to harness that, combine it with the experience we've learned over the last 50 years, and, uh, and we'll get out of low Earth orbit. Uh, that's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you.